peaceful and peaceful use outer space that contribute to global stability on Earth. Our mission is to work with governments, industry, international organizations, and civil society to develop and promote ideas and actions to achieve the secure, sustainable, and peaceful use of outer space, again, benefiting Earth and all its peoples. We are dedicated to the establishment of an effective and efficient systems of governance for outer space and improving the safety operations in Earth orbit. This effort includes developing the tools of governance that lead to reducing the threat of orbital debris, promoting international civil space situation awareness to improve knowledge and transparency, and preventing the creation of additional debris through hostile acts. So today you have the slide here over how to ask questions. We will be um, accepting questions in the Q&A portion. So you can see step one by the Q&A button, click on it. Look and see if someone's asked a question you wanna ask, if you see any questions that look interesting, you can upvote them by clicking the happy thumb. Um, and then if not, then just put in the question that you wanna have a, uh, answered and we'll go from there. Um, please don't put any questions in the chat itself. And general reminder, um, if there's a chat, that everyone can see everything. I would like to um, say as well, this event is on the record. It is being recorded. The video will be up on our website in a couple of days. It will have a transcript made and media have been invited. And so the format for today is we're gonna have our keynote speaker um, give a presentation and then a panel. And after which the Q and A will be held for all, for the keynote and the panelists. So we have plenty of time to be thinking of great questions and with this group of experts at the end. With that, um, get right to the meat of it. I'd like to go to our keynote speaker. Um, the Space Data Association is one of the first efforts by industry to share space situation awareness data and coordinate efforts to enhance the safety of space flight. Its Space Data Center is now 10 years old as of this month. Happy belated birthday, SDC. Our keynote speaker, Pascal Wauthier, will now discuss how the organization was created and how it evolved over the past decade. Pascal joined SES in 1990 as a flight dynamics engineer and is currently leading SES space operations, where, is he where he is responsible for safely operating SES, GEO, and MEO O3B satellites, more than 70 satellites. In November 2019, he was elected the chairman of the Space Data Association. Pascal, take it away. Thanks a lot, Victoria. Maybe you can go to the presentation. Okay, so next slide. Okay, starting maybe with a quote. So since 2005, the number of satellites launched into space has been increasing regularly, year on year. Last year, the MIT Technology Review predicted that the number of satellites orbiting Earth could quintuple in the next decade. The proliferation of small sat and Leo satellite projects being, of course, the key driver of this increase. This has a huge potential to cause debris fragmentation events and severe congestion beyond the scale we ever seen before. So, of course, tracking these satellites will become extremely complex, emphasizing the importance of continuing to feed and share accurate, actionable data via independent repositories like the Space Data Center, the SDC which, as already mentioned by Victoria, celebrates this year its 10 years of flight, serv flight safety services. So during the next 15 minutes or so, you will learn how the SDA and SDC tackle the flight safety gaps, the lessons learned from these 10 years of FDC operations, and the changes of SDA would expect to see in the coming 10 years. Next slide, please. So let's go back to 2009-2010. What triggered the creation of SDA and SDC? This is very well described in a quote from T.S. Kelso, the worldwide recognized expert in space traffic management, so-called STM, when he presented a look back on STM from 2029 in a looking back panel at the AMOS conference in 2019. Here is what he was saying. That started in 2008 with pioneers like Intelsat, Inmasat, SES, and Telesat doing something that in 2019 might be called crowdsourcing. We realized that STM, unlike STC, is not geographically limited and that any accidents would affect the global space commons. That means STM was an international issue 
and an international organization, NDA in this case, was formed to manage data collection, quality control, analysis, and reporting. And satellite operator realized that STM was truly a collaborative effort and that individual operators or countries could not do it alone. Next slide, please. So back in 2010, I think we maybe we should go back to slide four there. I think we skipped a couple of charts there. You can go back to slide four, please. Yes, thank you. Back in 2010, the existing products and services for flight safety did meet satellite operator needs. Why not? What were the gaps? The main gap is that only few operators had the capability to monitor close approaches using publicly available space track information or had a separate agreement with JSPO. These free legacy SSS or Space Situation Awareness Services were intended as heads of notice of an upcoming close approach, but because the notice was considered as not, very not verified, sorry, therefore not trusted, it was not acted upon. Why did the operators not trust those close approaches notices? Here are two main reasons. The first one, SSA products and services were unnecessarily degraded by simplification, faulty assumption, or lack of quality control. Comparison of SSA data with operator space data identified issues like unrealistic position, velocity, error covariance profiles, errant observational and orbit association with the object mean to represent. Second reason, SSA products failed to incorporate spacecraft operator data. In particular, the closure approach notice failed to consider station keeping maneuvers, which are quite frequent on geosatellites, for example, typically once per week. So generating misleading or errant threat warnings, but more alarming, missing true close approaches. Also back in 2010, a lot of close approaches coordination was done through personal contacts between various flight dynamics groups. Next slide, please. Before describing how the SDC fills these gaps I just described, let me first describe what the SDA and SDC do provide. So formed in 2009, the Space Data Association is a formal non-profit association of civil, commercial, and military spacecraft operators that supports the control, reliable, and efficient sharing of data that is critical to the safety and integrity of satellite operations. SDA has a legal structure and agreements that provide protections and informants mechanism to ensure that data is only used for intended purposes. Another key purpose of the SDA is to promote responsible behaviors from operators in all orbital domains to ensure the protection of key assets and the space environment. SDA works also with all interested parties, entities to help define the next generation of STM systems and capabilities. Next slide, please. Finally, the Space Data Association relies on the Space Data Center, famous SDC, operated by AGI for flight safety data exchange and processing. Who are the users of the SDC system? The SDC system provides services to 30 global operators of spacecraft spanning all orbital regimes, form factors, and mission types. The SDC system performs safety of flight analysis for nearly 800 spacecraft, about 500 spacecraft in LEO and MEO orbits, and uh, more than uh, 270 spacecraft in the geo orbit. Next slide, please. Let's describe briefly the current SDC 1.0 system uh, that I refer to, to the drawing there. I will describe the data flow from left to right. So on the left are the data contributors, which are either the SDC members who upload either manually or using a machine-to-machine -machine interface, the maneuver plan or ephemerates with maneuver plans backed in, or the US government space data with CDMs or special perturbation ephemerates, of course, pending uh, uh, SSA data sharing agreements with the JSPO. And then another option is a CLS track database for TLE elements, mainly for debris. 
The SD system is then processing this data using two interrelated subsystems. So you have the SD system, which is a lower box on the right, which is performing TLD-based flight safety warnings. That means it's performing conjunction assessment using operator ephemerates and TLEs for debris and issue notification to the members. The SDC OPS subsystem with a box on top is performing a second stage SP refinement to SDC TLE-based conjunction assessment. That means it's processing the SP data in a CDM from the US government and compare with the operator ephemerates conjunction assessment and issue result of this comparison to the operator. So the operator has full visibility of this comparison. And of course, this allows also the SDC operator, AGI, to do an effective quality of control of the data. I will come back on that. Next slide, please. No back. Uh, can we go on slide eight, please? Uh, are we, no, we are not on slide eight. Can you go on slide eight? Yes, thank you. So back to the key question. How does the SDA and SDC change SSA? Let me start with what I think are the two main contributions of SDA. Can you go back one slide? I think you jumped again one slide. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So first, so let me start, what I think are the two main contributions of SDA. First, by providing interfaces to JSPOC and space tracks, and by developing an efficient monitoring and warning system using operator operational information, SDA has been providing effective conjunction assessment capabilities to a large number of operators. I recall that until 2010, only a few larger operator at effective SSA capabilities. Second key contribution. During the last 10 years, the SDA, SD, sorry, the SDC and AGI experts have demonstrated that effective SSA relies on using the best available data to manage close approaches. In fact, for active satellite, SDA and AGI demonstrated the importance of using the operator information about the maneuver plan, which could be quite complex for electric propulsion with frequent burns every day. Next slide, please. I would like now to describe three key elements of the uh, SDC services, which significantly changed SSA. First, the SDC was upfront of data exchange technology. Indeed, the SDC framework emphasizes and facilitates broad crowdsourcing and data exchange for the purpose of safety of flight, similar to a data lake construct. Second key element, the SDC system benefits from AGI experts who are closely monitoring the data quality by comparing information from different sources. This comparison has revealed many discrepancies in SSA and operator space data product. Geo operator discovered, for example, that certain of their satellites were operated few hundreds of a degree away from their nominal longitude slot due to ranging biases. The system issues also notification in case of a discrepancy or expired SSA input data. Uh, third key element, through the SDC services, the SDA is significantly contributing to improve SSA capabilities by, for example, encouraging JSPOC to publish CDM with covariance matrix and by working with JSPOC and Stratcom to pioneer application of SP ephemeris in 2014 for best of breed flight safety services. Next slide, please. To complete the presentation of SSA changes triggered by the SDA, let me quote two SDA director colleagues and Dan Oltrock from AGI CSSI. The first code, the SDSDC showed operator that it was possible to screen, to screen all on all object and have a strong legal framework. It also forced a cooperation between operator, even though there were competitors in the same marketplace. 
I would complement this code by saying that SDC provides a computational SQL framework on top of the legal SQL framework, protecting operator property data to prevent an authorized release and providing control, reliable and efficient sharing of information. Note also that SDC provides a granular operator phone book by area of responsibility, location, and management level. Second code. It feels the need to have a commercial solution that is independent on a given nation's desire to provide a free, non-optimum service. It underpins the need of a shared approach for the utilization of near-Earth space, which is a finite resource, as we all know. Third quote, it leapfrogs the institutional services by providing more reliable conjunction warnings. Okay, go to the next slide. So I've described the SDC and SDA and how they are effectively contributing to flight safety. But the true question is, how do we achieve true long-term sustainability of space activities? Here are three elements of answers based on SDA, SDC lessons learned during the last 10 years. First, flight safety derives from the comprehensive aggregation of massive amount of observation, data, environment statistics, and risk assessment, and of course, advanced analytics. Second element of answer highlights the importance of data exchange, becoming increasingly important as the number of operational spacecraft dominate the non-debris population. During the last 10 years, the SDA has always championed collaboration and information sharing through its SDC system. And it is this model which continues to meet a risk for all operators. Third element of answer is in fact an advice. Government SSA and STM initiative should learn about the SDC system and its operational concept. In particular, about SDC innate ability to crowdsource space data from spacecraft operator and merge them with accurate space debris catalog from the US Air Force, for example which has allowed SDC to generate decision quality space traffic coordination and management analytics, so-called STCM, serve as a distribution hub for space data, be a focal point for comparative SSA and quality control, and finally provide high availability SSA and STC services. Next slide. So to conclude my presentation here, I will try to answer the following question. What changes would, would SDA like to see in SSA in the coming 10 years? I will focus on three changes. First, ultimate goal is to support a safe and sustainable operating environment, realized by globally, globally relevant, readily available safety of flight services that espouse and incorporate space data exchange commercial SSA and STM services that pair new sensor technology with advanced data fusion algorithm to dramatically improve SSA solution and prediction. Second change related to the above, involve life safety policies, which are not yet equipped to accommodate the rapid change associated with first, the new space large constellation, and second, improve SSA sensor and enlarge space catalog. What's the effect of these two changes? They will overwhelm the operator with conjunction alarms, perhaps by a factor of 50 or even 100. How to avoid and manage that situation? This can be resolved by A, greatly improve SSA accuracy, completeness, timeliness, and transparency to limit alarms to those requiring an action, those requiring an action. And B, once the SSA data is improved enough to support it, Introduce, introducing new safety constructs to include, for example, autonomous SSA. Next slide, please. As a third change, let me share with you the SDA vision. Our vision is to promote and support the application of advanced SSA analytics and sensor types through so commercial SSA services, crowdsourcing on a global scale, sensor agnostic data fusion, in new government, new government SSA and STM initiatives. In particular, we want to support the US Department of Commerce initiative 
to provide space traffic coordination and management services, as well as other government initiatives like the European Space Surveillance and Tracking System, so-called EUSST. Finally, I would like to complete that presentation by thanking Dan Oltrock for major CSSI, uh, CSSI for his valuable inputs to this uh, keynote speech. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you, Pascal. Um, really appreciate having that insight to how SDA evolved and the thinking through the processes that you guys created over the past 10 years. And now we're looking forward to having our panel speak. So here's the slide with our panels, panelists. Um, we have them listed alphabetically, but just to shake things up, I wanna have introduce them in the order in which they'll be speaking. So our first speaker will be Mark Maholland. Mark has held a wide range of satellite acquisition and space operations jobs dating back to 1976. He has had careers in the US Air Force, National Reconnaissance Office, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. He is currently a consultant the Director of the Office of Space Commerce in the U.S. Department of Commerce. Mark, it's all yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Good morning, afternoon, and I guess evening, everyone. Thanks once again to Secure World Foundation for putting together a great virtual event. The big thing I miss about gathering at your D.C. headquarters are your great receptions, and the opportunity to talk to old friends and to make new acquaintances. Keep doing what you're doing, please. Because we're here to mark the 10th anniversary of the Space Data Association, I'd like to spend a few minutes looking back before actually doing what Victoria asked us to do by looking forward. One of the highlights of my NOAA career was that we were the first government agency to join the Space Data Association. After several meetings at the working level, senior SDA officials soon found themselves in the office of the NOAA administrator at the time, Dr. Kathy Sullivan. Kathy certainly understood the value of safe space operations because on three separate occasions, she was an orbiting space object herself. So for NOAA, joining SDA was a no-brainer. Despite the wheels of government turning slowly, NOAA became an SDA member finally in May 2012. Shortly afterwards, NASA joined. Shortly after NASA, NOAA's European mission partner, UMETSAT, asked NOAA if they should join as well. I'll summarize our conversation as one in which I said, you're crazy if you don't join. In the eight years that NOAA has been an SDA member, NOAA had great success using the capabilities that SDI and the AGI Commercial Space Operations Center provided for spaceflight safety of the NOAA geostationary weather satellite constellation called GOES. The dedicated and hardworking people at the 18th Space Control Squadron are at the limit of their capabilities to keep up with the rate at which commercial space operators are changing the spacescape, to coin a phrase, of near Earth orbit. SDA, through their operational partners, were able to relieve a huge load off the 18th in especially the geostationary orbit regime. The accuracy of the observations combined with the confidence of SDA members dramatically improved geostationary operations. Here are some examples from NOAA's experience. Before transitioning to the SDA for primary geostationary support, NOAA received, during a two-year period, over 17,000 conjunction warnings for its four GOES satellites. That's 21 warnings per day if you're playing along at home. In the last two years of relying on ComSpot warnings, NOAA has re received exactly one warning. I can't even begin to fathom how much critical weather data would have been lost if NOAA had taken GOES satellites offline to perform needless collision avoidance maneuvers for even half of those 17,000 warnings. <clears throat> NOAA operates its eastern satellite, <clears throat> goes east, at 75 degrees west longitude. Occupying 75 west were Brazilian government communication satellites. Based on SDA support, 
NOAA and Brazil have safely operated up to four satellites within one half of a degree of each other since 2008. NOAA also shares its three other geostationary slots with at least one other spacecraft. Annual SDA member meetings have allowed NOAA to learn in advance of new neighbors moving into their geostationary positions and to begin early operational co-location planning. <clears throat> I could talk all day about how NOAA's membership in SDA has enabled their mission. However, the task at hand is to look five years into the future. We have talked about the future of SSA and space flight safety in the Department of Commerce Office of Space Commerce on almost a daily basis since the release of Space Policy Directive 3 in June 2018. And of course, for many years earlier in international and domestic settings. As a matter of fact, uh, judging from Pascal's charts, he could have written SPD3. The clear objective is to transition the commercial and international SSA mission from the U.S. Department of Defense to the Department of Commerce. SPD3 mandates that this transfer take place by 2024. According to NASA and ESA statistics, it took about four years to increase the number of active satellites <clears throat> from about 2,000 to today's rough total of 3,000. We are looking at adding another 1,000 in just this year alone, <clears throat> and the number will accelerate every year in the future. So by 2025, very conservative estimates predict anywhere from 10 to 15,000 new active satellites if just a handful of companies come close to their projected launch schedules. The numbers tell just a small part of the story. Many of these large constellation operators will be constantly launching and deorbiting satellites. So there will be a large number of satellites always going up and always coming down and passing through numerous operational orbits. New low thrust propulsion systems and maneuvering by differential drag make traditional conjunction analysis techniques pretty much incompatible with how operators are flying satellites today. We are already seeing new commercial missions emerge. Satellite servicing, commercial human spaceflight, space tourism, and missions beyond geostationary orbit, just to name a few. We need help from the commercial operators as well. <clears throat> they need to make it easier for the SSA infrastructure to find and catalog their satellites. They need to tell us what they're going to do and when they're going to do it. We need a new and unprecedented level of transparency including, I think, redefining traditional definitions and boundaries of proprietary information. At the very least, operators, perhaps even competitors, need to talk to each other in the coming era where, where there will be more conjunctions between active satellites than between satellites and debris. The best way, and perhaps the only way, to maintain and improve safe operations is to enable industry itself to quickly develop and implement a new SSA infrastructure within the commerce industry partnership. The space sector is much more able to adapt quickly to a changing environment than any government agency. We need improved sensors that reduce position errors to the minimum amount possible. We need conjunction assessment tools that keep up with satellite design and operations. We need to automate as much of the spaceflight safety infrastructure as possible using every tool at our disposal. We are establishing a cloud-based open architecture data repository for commercial space operators under a light touch level of supervision and standards to manage safe spaceflight operations and to develop new tools and techniques in a collaborative sandbox on the cloud. SPD3 requires us to offer a basic service free of charge and to enable private industry to develop and market advanced services to companies performing complex space operations. I'll conclude by saying that I'm glad I went first because I want to hear from industry and our international partners present today about how they do the next five years so that we in space commerce can keep up with them. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mark. That was a great kickoff to our panel. Our next speaker is Marilini Deshpande. Marilini has a master's degree in defense and strategic studies and started as a research fellow with the International Strategic 
and Security Studies program at, in NIAS, Bangalore until 2019. She was briefly associated with the Center for Air Power Studies in New Delhi. Currently, she is pursuing her plans for a PhD in the field of space security and policy. Marilene, take it away. Yeah. Thank you, Victoria. I hope I'm audible. Um, yes, we can hear you great. Yeah. At the outset, I would like to thank the Secure World Foundation for giving me this opportunity to provide an Indian perspective on today's topic. Because of the time constraint, I'm going to drive straight into it. In recent years, India's space activities have seen an increase in both magnitude and frequency. India's space budget this year is in the region of $1.8 billion, and India currently has a fleet of 64 active satellites. Today, India launches 10 to 12 satellites per year. This capacity is likely to increase in the future. In addition to deep space missions and human space flight, India has also planned the space docking experiment in the near future. The government has an has also provided separate funds for launch vehicle production to cater to domestic and commercial launches. Steps have been taken to get private players and startups to invest in space. Now a robust space program of this nature obviously necessitates an equally robust SSA capability. India continues to be dependent on foreign data for its SSA needs. There have been instances in the past where India has temporarily lost track of its satellite due to mission-related causes and had to obtain services of friendly agencies to locate them. India regularly uses the NORAD data to perform the collision avoidance analysis prior to each launch. Based on the NORAD TLEs, the Indian Space Research Organization has developed various mathematical models to predict and evaluate the trajectory of re-entering spacecrafts and rocket bodies. In addition to this, ISRO has also developed several models to study the evolution of space debris environment collision probability analysis, and re-entry predictions. If we were to broadly classify components of SSA into data collection, data fusion, analytics, and decision-making tools, it would seem that until recently, India has been solely focusing on the analytics and decision-making tool components, while primarily relying on foreign data. However, in recent years, India has made an effort to build its own SSA capability. Presently, India has only one ground-based radar dedicated for SSA purposes. The multi-object tracking radar, commissioned in 2015, is currently used for space debris analysis in the powered and orbital phases during satellite launches and re-entry prediction of debris. In addition to the MOTR, India also hosts a number of optical telescope facilities on its mainland. These telescope facilities fall under the aegis of the Indian Institute of Astrophysics, and their primary focus is astronomical observations. However, a few of the telescopes from these observatories have been used to track satellites on a need basis. Now, in 2019, ISRO set up a Directorate of Space Situational Awareness and Management. The activities mandated to be taken by the DSSAM include protection of Indian space satellites, assimilate and analyze tracking data of inactive satellites from indigenous observation facilities, enable research activities pertaining to active debris removal, space debris modeling, and mitigation. For countries like India, who are still developing their SSA capabilities, there will always be trade-offs between more data collection and theory-based prediction algorithms. Co therefore, cooperation and sharing of SSA data is most favorable. In June 2020, ISRO signed a MOU with the Aryabhatta Research Institute of Observational Sciences, ARES, to facilitate the establishment of optical telescope facilities for tracking space objects and to promote studies related to space weather, astrophysics, and near-Earth objects. In addition to this, ISRO has also signed a MOU with the University of Texas to enable collaboration with respect to SSA activities. Actionable data sharing with other spacefaring entities, nations, and independent repositories would only enhance India's current capabilities with respect to satellite orbit determination, conjunction assessment, collision avoidance, and satellite anomaly detection. Reciprocity is fundamental to cooperation and collaboration, and India has undertaken substantial efforts to expand the scope of its current SSA activities. The consequences of activities in space are inherently international, and it is important to ensure equitable access to the benefits of exploration and use of outer space for peaceful purposes. Achieving long-term sustainability in space would require a global effort towards augmenting current space debris mitigation and space debris removal techniques, cataloging of space objects, and most importantly, sharing of information. 
active debris removal techniques and on orbit servicing involve rendezvous and proximity maneuvering recently the deployment of russia space based anti satellite weapons raised red flags in the international community today it is easy to detect an international maneuver in space however the time required to catalog it is still longer than desired similarly sensors are able to detect maneuvers in space but often the intentions of such operations are not clear or are difficult to determine unexpected orbital behavior can be misconstrued as belligerent giving room for misperceptions and misunderstandings on a global level this underscores the vital need to develop and establish international norms for response behavior in space unpredictable movements in space will only fuel misperceptions and therefore information sharing and engagement and cooperation between space faring nations becomes important this calls for a comprehensive and holistic approach to ssa where technical tracking and monitoring is complemented with intelligence gathering diplomacy and strategic dialogue tools for cooperation developing international norms that clearly define what is acceptable and unacceptable behavior in space is necessary the effectiveness of military operations too in space is very much dependent on the development of these norms in 2018 during an ssa workshop by the secure world foundation and nias the importance of cross culture communication was highlighted it was reiterated again during the 62nd session of the committee on the peaceful uses of outer space in 2019 along with transparency in data sharing and increased accuracy of data practicing culture and and when communicating with other operators will go a long way in mitigating threat perceptions and avoiding acts lastly the growing role of private players in the space arena cannot be overlooked and needs to be complemented with the development of domestic space policies that would ensure that private satellite operators adhere to the global space sustainability standards by possessing thorough and robust collision avoidance data sharing and debris mitigation strategy economic growth in the space sector should not be at the cost of lax sustainability measures thank you great thank you so much marlene that was really good insights I'm so glad to have an indian perspective or an indian thank perspective you. all right our next speaker is mark dickinson mark joined inmarsat in 2000 and is currently the vice president of space segment and deputy cto He is Inmarsat's executive director on the SDA and was the association's chairman from March 2017 until September 2019. Mark. Uh, thank you very much Victoria. Uh, and thank you to Paul Secure World Foundation for running this uh, very interesting uh, webinar. Um and thank you all to Pascal who did uh, I thought did a great job in um presenting the SDA. So I'm not going to uh, repeat what he said. Uh, I thought I'll take a slightly different approach to looking at this issue and actually rather than just look back over the last 10 years uh, look back actually over the last 180 years and see what lessons we can learn from the development of the uh, collision regulations for the sea and how they could be and those lessons could be applied and how they're relevant to what we're looking at today and in particular how technology is really a disruptor and how we need to have a framework that can adapt to Uh, to this new technologies as it comes along so going back to 1840 a long time ago 180 years ago there were there were no collision regulations for vessels at sea basically you trusted people to know they know how to sail they knew where the wind was you knew that vessels could only sail at that time and that you couldn't sail into the wind and therefore people could make educated guesses about what was going to happen to avoid collisions but collisions did happen then some technology came along which really was a disruptor the invention of steam powered vessels and how these could actually sail now through the wind directly into the wind which was never possible before and now collisions took on a collision avoidance took on a whole new um different concept people realized that the the assumptions that they had before were no longer relevant and in mid 1840s trinity house in london developed a set of collision regulations essentially what's known today as like you pass port port side to port side uh, as a a framework for how people can avoid these collisions and a couple of years later 
they also realized they needed to um, deploy some conventions around using lights to indicate where vessels were, and importantly, which direction vessels were moving in. Um, unfortunately, as is the case with regulations like this, or essentially almost treated as recommendations, they weren't really, weren't really enforced in any serious manner. And there were there continued to be a number of serious collisions. And in fact, there was a major one actually in River Thames in London in 1878, I think it was, where actually 700 people lost their lives in the during a collision. And it was those big events which actually forced people to have some enforcement behind these regulations. And I think the parallel here for space is really important. We want to avoid having a major event which we react to subsequently. We want to be able to be proactive here rather than reactive. Otherwise, as has been pointed out, if we pollute uh, various orbit, orbital regimes, it's going to cause us long-term problems, and those problems are for everyone. Then it really wasn't until the 1970s that the IMO introduced the what's known as the collision regulations at sea, uh, which were implemented in the late 70s, in 1977. And the administration of those regulations were passed through the local administrations. And those administrations can be thought a bit like the space agencies who are looking to implement the recommendations that we have today for uh, collision uh, avoidance and best practice um, for satellite operations. I checked on Wikipedia just a couple of days ago, and there are currently 61 space agencies around the world who have uh, obligations around satellite operations and I think that really highlights that this is a true international um, issue that needs to be managed. No one single entity can do it all uh, and it's about having um, administrations who have the ability to oversight and enforce these um, recommendations and um, regulations. And we've seen in, on the shipping uh, side the, the development of AIS. This is technology to allow people to be able to see in an open source way where vessels are and where they're heading to and various details about it. And that information has helped greatly in the management of uh, where shipping goes and, help, has, and help, has helped reduce collisions. And now shipping is looking at things like autonomous shipping and the IMO will now need to look at about how they manage things like redundancy on board and sensors that are required to manage autonomous shipping. And I think a, a number of these points have strong parallels to the issues that we face today. Technology is a disruptor. We've seen, and I think this, the new space uh, era now with constellations, with CubeSats, with on-orbit servicing, the reason, these are all new exciting innovations that are happening in space and we need a framework that allows the safe operations to uh, for this uh, innovation to make sure that we don't cause um, collisions or, collu or cause a pollution of the space environment because we need the space environment to be operational for the uh, forever and we can't um, cause great lots of pollution now because it's not going to be easy to uh, clean up we do need as uh, Pascal has highlighted, we need the ability to have knowledge about where uh, satellites are and what their intentions are in terms of where they're going to be in the future to allow uh, um, effective mitigation measures. And has been highlighted, there's new technology there around low thrust systems, how they need to be managed and how they need to be modeled to make sure that we can effectively perform uh, conjunction assessment. I think we really, I think the, uh, the onus on us is to be proactive here. Uh, we don't want the equivalent of a large collision uh, at sea to uh, force us uh, in space to have to tidy up after ourselves. This is something we should take seriously, we take very seriously now uh, and have enforcement measures to make sure that people are obeying by the regulations. We should use science and engineering uh, as best we can to guide what those uh, rec uh, regulations should be. We need to have a way of, uh, of uh, measuring risk uh, in a common way to make sure that we're making intelligent uh, assessments of where the risk lies. 
I think we also need to look at what technology, as there's a huge amount of technology that the, the commercial sector has, whether it's SSA sensors, or whether it's ability to be able to provide information regarding where an asset is and what sits in attention in the future, the equivalent to AIS for space. It's capabilities like that, that when we fuse together, we'll be able to uh, mitigate and provide a safe uh, operational environment. And I think government's, government's role is vital in this. Just as the Coast Guards maintain the safety of the sea, um, we need governments to also maintain space and agencies to maintain safety uh, in orbit. Um, but they, for that, they need, as well as their own sensors, they need to be able to take sensors, uh, sensor data from many sources, uh, commercial, government, and from operators. So I, I think the, th this, is a real, this isn't something that we can wait years to do. This is something we need to act upon quickly. Otherwise, we're going to be looking back in five years' time, wishing we had done things now, uh, because we have caused a big problem for future gener generations to manage. Back to you, Victoria. Thank you so much, Mark. And that was a really interesting look back to see, you know, what lessons can be learned from other shared domains. We are absolutely not reinventing the wheel with this discussion. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is Regina Peltzis. Regina is a senior policy officer with the DLR Space Administration, Department of Space Situational Awareness, where she leads the German delegation to the EU Space Surveillance and Tracking, or EUSST, co-chairs its decision-making body, and handles studies on emerging issues at the intersection of space security, governance, and infrastructure. Prior to joining DLR, Medina was an internal research fellow with ESA at the European Space Operations Center Studies and Special Projects Division, focusing on the resilience of critical operations from a human systems integration perspective. Medina, take away. Thank you so much um, for the introduction, Victoria, and um, also for having us uh, with you today and good afternoon to everyone. And um, before I start and after Mark's, um, well, not, uh, um, well, we can't be optimistic, um, I guess at this point, but at the, nevertheless, we'd like to extend our best wishes from EUSST to everyone at SDA uh, today. Both of our initiatives address uh, similar issues, a safe, secure, and sustainable orbital environment. And we both have complementary approaches, as you highlighted, by either pooling data um, on spacecraft uh, by operators in SDA or data from ground-based sensors uh, of SSA, uh, SSA in EUSST. And of course, we also share many of the same partners and organizations who either use or contribute to our, uh, both of our efforts. And so a very happy birthday to you um, from us. Um, for the occasion today, I'd like to share some thoughts on where we're at in Europe at this uh, point in time and uh, on the foreseeable future, particularly from the vantage point of European Union Space Surveillance and Tracking, or EUSST. And very briefly, EUSST is a European framework based on uh, a law that was um, issued in 2014, and it's gonna be soon a program for a multilateral capability in space situational aware, uh, awareness here. It's overseen by the European Com uh, Union, the European Commission, and it's implemented by a group of now eight member states uh, in cooperation with the EU Satellite Center. And together we pool uh, our existing sensors together and we share data through a dedicated platform and we use that to provide uh, services including collision avoidance uh, free of charge to currently to European users. And um, right now, um, Europe is experiencing a really interesting um, point in time. Uh, it's, it's a really crucial time for, for space and a juncture really. Um, as many of you will have uh, noticed when you perhaps observed the European Council recently, um, we are in the process of finalizing and ratifying a new multi-annual budget uh, in Europe, in the European Union, which includes the space budget. And with this, we're also at the cusp of a new European Union space program that's set to start uh, next year. And in addition to the big navigation uh, and Earth observation programs, Galileo Ignis and Copernicus, um, the program will also include two new so-called uh, two new, so uh, new security components, uh, which is government communications and SSA. Um, and SSA will be a successor program of EUSST, um, both for space security, but also as uh, an operational building block for 
uh, future STM uh, contributions from the European side. So this will be fleshed out further in the coming months and throughout the next year. And this autumn is really um, important for us um, because of that. And all of this um, on the ground is happening against the backdrop of our orbital domain, uh, undergoing changes that are not only profound, but also very dynamic and completely unprecedented at this point. So what do we need to do in the next five years? And I want to highlight three points that um, from our vantage point, we believe need to be tackled in any multilateral setting in Europe, but also um, absolutely beyond. First of all, um, we need to ensure that we put in place adequate resources so we can actually implement uh, what we set out uh, to do in SSA. So financially, these resources are to a great extent public in Europe uh, rather than private investment at this uh, stage in time. But these means also include attention and dedication because compared to space applications such as Galileo or GPS, which you can take if you switch on your phone or you could look at Earth observation data from, from various different sources, um, SSA today is simply not as tangible and directly experiential um, in people's everyday lives. So um, framing the issue that we face in orbit through the lens of space traffic management is very evocative and can help us as a community of operators and agencies and industry to make our case. But it also highlights the fact that um, this is a really complex challenge and a really interdisciplinary area uh, where we have operational, uh, uh, an operational dimension, but of course also uh, need regulatory uh, provisions. Second, um, we need to work out ways of governance uh, that bring those on board who are currently not engaged in the area of SSA yet, but who wish to contribute because the problem we're looking at is so um, considerable and potentially protracted that there must be a place for everyone um, at the table who has expertise to bring. Which is not to say, of course, that everyone needs to have the full capability from sensor hardware churning out data to the algorithms and the services, but with um, organizations such as SDA and EOSST, we've seen two models, for instance, in the past five to 10 years, um, where we see how collaboration can work and how trust can be built between different and, and very heterogeneous actors. So in EOSST, for instance, we work um, with really diverse actors from SSA op centers and sensors that are civilian, military, civilian military, from commercial industry or academia. So very, very uh, uh, varied. And getting all of these uh, different actors and interests under one roof and under one hat means a constant and uh, often painstakingly detailed dialogue, but it also allows um, everyone to do what they do best. And it allows us to tap into the entire ecosystem that we have at our hands here, um, while at the same time preserving some fundamental interests uh, in the security area that today cannot be met by one type of actor alone. Speaking of which, uh, security interests, that's my third and, and final point. Whether you do um, SSA or STM or STC, SDA, domain awareness, uh, traffic coordination, whatever we want to uh, call it at this point, we need to be really crystal clear about where our security concerns are specifically and where, if you will, safety of flight uh, stops and where security starts. And I'm speaking here, of course, from an institutional uh, agency perspective, although, of course, there's also, as we've heard, sensitive data that private operators would wish to protect and uh, only share in a certain uh, defined circle. And this not only relates to data sharing and data policy, but it also relates to sensor ownership and control and who has access to certain aspects of the ground infrastructure. And it's very easy to say, but the reality today is that we do still have a very varied security architecture globally and especially multilaterally, uh, very different configurations. And this is important, especially as we branch out to collaborate across the entire spectrum of partners who on the one hand have operational legacies of decades with maneuverable assets in orbit. And on the other hand uh, of the spectrum, who have no satellites perhaps, but still something valid to contribute uh, to, the, to the domain of SSA and STM. And that would allow us to, well, if we articulated and really pinpointed those aspects that truly merit um, protection from an individual actor's security perspective, then that means that beyond that threshold, everyone can do their job with the broadest possible uh, application and transparency. And with this, um, I conclude and uh, look forward to your question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Regina. It was really, really great um, to hear the parallels between SDA 
the USST and looking forward to hearing more from your perspective during the Q&A. Our last speaker is Dan Ultrogi. He is the director of AGI's Center for Space Standards and Innovation, program manager of the Space Data Association, analyst and space policy expert for AGI's Commercial Space Operations Center, technical author, founder and administrator of the Space Safety Coalition, which Secure World is happy to have signed on to as well, and the author of numerous international space standards and best practices. Dan? Dan, you're up. Okay. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Great, Great. thank you. Sorry about that. Thanks, Victoria. Uh, my thanks to Secure World Foundation for inviting me to speak at this important event, marking the 10-year anniversary of safety of flight operations at the Space Data Center. This is a truly remarkable accomplishment from my perspective and the many pioneering achievements of the SDC that Pascal highlighted earlier are truly noteworthy. While I serve as a program manager of the SDC at AGI, my role in this panel is a bit broader than the SDC in that I also represent the Space Safety Coalition or SSC, a lot of acronyms going on here. The SSC is an industry formed entity that endorses and strives to implement not only international treaties, guidelines and standards, but additionally to aspire to even more stringent levels of compliance and safety. With four new SSC endorsees, including two recently from Asia, our participating set of space entities has quickly expanded to 44. This SSC initiative continues to resonate well across the space community. I'll put in my shameless plug here for the SSC, uh, which is that you can find more information out about the Space Safety Coalition at spacesafety.org, and we'd love to have your participation. When you consider an aggregate, the commercially self-formed Space Data Association, paid for entirely by the commercial and government operators that participate in the SDA services, as well as the commercially formed SSC, and the additional space safety initiatives and best practices championed by ISOA and SIA and CSF and others, you can gain an appreciation for the positive flight safety energy that the commercial space industry is bringing to the long-term sustainability of our space activities. Because in truth, our international treaties, guidelines, and standards are struggling to keep up with the explosive growth and technical innovations of today's space economy and the countless ways that it is addressing human needs and activities, especially now during the pandemic. Treaties are designed to be broad agreements among state actors with top level normative content that is designed to be interpreted and instantiated by national laws by the countries that have ratified those treaties. The recent adoption last year of 21 new LTS guidelines is also a very positive step forward, but it will take law and policymakers time to implement this guidance across the space enterprise via top-down regulations. This is where the commercial space industry can and already has come in to capture, promote, and implement aspirational best practices through commercial self-formed entities such as the SDA and SSC as a part of that implementation and in advance of legal governance. Now, if we could start a video, please. Uh, it is an exciting time with the much discussed large constellations now well underway. We recently updated our CSSI statistics and associated video we posted in January, 2020 depicting all of the spacecraft that have been applied for through the FCC and or ITU. In the space of a few years, Planet, SpaceX, and OneWeb have recently grown to operate a quarter or 751 of today's 3,000 active spacecraft population. In this new version of the video, we depict the 107,641 spacecraft that have been applied for through 2029 to be operated by up to 68 large constellation operators. 
Now, four of these large constellation operators comprise over 90% of all of these large constellation applications. And US and UK space companies account for about 95% of all large constellation spacecraft applied for. But everyone wonders the, the basic question here. What portion of these applications are quote unquote real, actually leading to operational spacecraft? And also, what will that realized population mean for space situational awareness, or SSA, and space traffic coordination and management, or STCM, and collision risk? There's no doubt that large constellations will have, and in fact already have had, a dramatic impact on SSA and STCM. Within 10 years, we can expect up to two and a half million close calls per year in the most congested orbital regimes, leading to over 40 collisions annually if these threats are not effectively managed and mitigated. Uh, stop the video, please. Thank you. Having participated in designing, developing, and operating flight safety systems for many years, I can attest to a human tendency to be proud of accomplishing the rollout of a space safety system without paying sufficient attention to whether it provides, on a sustained basis, comprehensive, accurate, and timely answers. This upcoming large constellation environment points to the need for automated collision avoidance systems, but in like manner, it can be all too easy to assemble an autonomous avoidance system without ensuring that it is effective in the operational context. Our focus needs to be on ensuring that SSA and STCM capabilities and services not only exist and are accessible, but also effective. Space safety is comprised of a long chain of components, in my opinion, and a chain is no stronger than its weakest link. In order to be effective, we need to think about the especially big gaps we have in our current processes. There are plenty of ways to strengthen this chain. For example, by bringing advanced algorithms and analytics from the commercial and academic arenas to bear in the SSA and STM environment. These can augment or replace some of today's SSA processes to eliminate unnecessary simplifications and faulty assumptions while enhancing overall SSA service level availability, timeliness, accuracy, and completeness. If you haven't read last week's Washington Post article by Chris Davenport, I recommend it to you. We need to get past our current US STCM logjam and quickly transition advanced capabilities and analytics into operations for safety of flight. If you listen closely to Pascal's keynote remarks, you'll have noted how a central tenet of the SDA is that of providing the framework for secure, legally protected pooling of proprietary space data for the express purpose of promoting the safe and efficient use of space. Today, we have far too many stovepiped SSA and spacecraft operation systems where the global aggregate set of space data is either not shared, not used, or not used effectively. Space safety can be dramatically improved if we open up the floodgates on space data in a crowdsourcing approach, alleviating some of today's stovepipe SSA processes. In summary, we need to take a holistic approach to realizing LTS. It's not just about treaties, guidelines, and standards. It's all of those, plus commercial best practices with aspirational goals of not only meeting but exceeding minimum consensus requirements. The time to address the many gaps in our LTS strategies is now especially in view of our ever-increasing use of space. Thanks, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dan. Okay, I'd like to welcome the panel back. If you guys could all turn your cameras back on, thank you. Um, so we have quite a bit of questions in the queue, um, but I wanna start off by just, you know, oftentimes um, we've kind of used SSA and STM interchangeably, but they are obviously very different. I'm curious to know from the panel's perspective, how do you envision a space traffic management regime looking in the next five years or so? Will it look like now, but even more so? Will you have maybe regional hubs of excellence? Will it be entirely commercial? Um, and how do you incorporate new actors in whatever this STM regime ends up being? 
Um, any thoughts on the panel? I can start. Uh, okay, uh, start with Dan and then go on to Mark Mullen. Yeah, I, I actually, I, yeah, I was looking at this question in, in earnest here uh, um, and, and starting an answer to it, but I think in actuality, the ST, and, and, and just to address the lingo a bit, um, I recently drafted up a proposed standard for space traffic coordination and management to, uh, to address and, and reach out to the international community, recognizing that coordination and management are, are parts of what various countries focus on. So STCM, I see, is an inclusive term. I'd like to promote that to the, to the community. Um, and, and so what does an STCM thing look like in the next five years? I would say that um, we have a running start with the Space Data Association. We have come up with a framework that has been effective now for a decade. I think that this framework uh, is something that everyone can look at and, and embrace and look to crowdsource data into that framework. Um, I, I think it's also a good model for the inevitable um, multiple STCM centers, I think that we'll have amongst like-minded countries and like-minded companies for a while. Uh, maybe in the long term, there'll be a, some, some vision of an, uh, you know, a, a more centralized international thing, but I think for quite a long time, we're gonna have the countries providing an STCM system that, that meets their needs. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Okay, Mark Maholland and then Regina, I think, wanted to add something. Yeah, we we certainly have the same sort of vision in, in space commerce. And uh, part of, uh, I mentioned earlier that um, we're setting up in the uh, cloud-based OADR, uh, what we're calling a sandbox. And we're, encouraging any and all to uh, basically play in the sandbox. And we're looking at that um, capability as a means to develop uh, new algorithms, as a means of, of evaluating new data sources and uh, do it in a collaborative and collegial environment where um, when something is ready for, for prime time, as a new tool, it will go through some sort of uh, peer review and then be put into the operational system. Um, we see a lot of parallels with uh, how we do weather forecasting today. Uh, as a matter of fact, we've, we've spent a lot of time um, talking over these ideas uh, with the National Weather Service. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the best approaches to, uh, to use um, use different data sources and different algorithms is uh, what the weather world calls ensemble modeling. And uh, probably the best example of that is if you look at a uh, plot of a, of a hurricane, um, you see all of the paths in what is affectionately called the spaghetti models. Well, it turns out that uh, for the life of an Atlantic hurricane, forecasters use something like 14 different models. And some are more effective at the beginning of the storm. Some are more effective over open ocean. Some are more effective uh, towards, uh, towards landfall. So um, ensemble modeling uh, provides you with the best overall picture uh, without having to, de to decide which model and which forecast is the best because in fact, they're all good at, at different times. So we see that as, uh, as a fundamental way of uh, of working through all the all the different data sources. Great, thank you, Mark. Regina. Thanks, thanks, Victoria. So, our understanding is um, just to complement. Um, our understanding is um, that you need SSA as a fundamental capability in order to do STM, like you would do it for uh, you would need it for other. Uh, capable uh, for other activities such as characterization, which uh, may maybe is not uh, or is not for us right now uh, part of STM. And since you asked how we may bring about or may bring in other actors um, who wish to uh, contribute to this area, um, 
we currently use a model where we split um, different functions. Not everyone is doing the entire capability, not every, everyone's doing everything, but we um, split our functions um, between different operational sensor and processing um, aspects. And for instance, not everyone who may have something to contribute to the domain wants to invest in a huge surveillance sensor. I mean, we also don't need surveillance sensors, which are hugely um, uh, um, um, expensive. We don't need them everywhere. We have seen very new and interesting models in, in the past um, five to six years on, on how they are different ways and even uh, cheaper sensors. But there's lots of different, um, there's a huge mosaic and a huge um, puzzle of, of things that we need. There should be something for everyone. There's um, algorithms, there's data processing software, there are different sensor classes ranging from, you know, things that you can develop, uh, or, you know, that you need to develop over decades perhaps and others that you can uh, procure off the shelf. So I think um, if we understand SSA as, as the fundamental building block to do STM and various other things, then there's lots of ways that different actors can slot in. Thank you, Regine. Any other thoughts from the panelists? No. Okay, moving on. Um, going to a lot of good questions in the queue. Um, try and get through as many of them as we can between now and the end of the session. Uh, there's an interesting question, and specifically it's for Dan, but I'd be curious to hear any of the panelists take on this. Um, is, is, is there any threshold where the number of satellites in low Earth orbit would make, impossible, make it impossible to operate because of so many collision warnings? despite communicating the data. What's our, what's our breaking point there? Yeah, uh, good question. I, th I think there is a, a workload that the operators can sustain, which is driven by how many conjunction warnings they have. And rather than answer the question directly, I'm, I'm gonna just offer that that workload, you can then kind of flip the question around and say, this is what we can uh, sustain. This is the resources we have. And um, you can, like, you have a, no a knob you can turn to control how many warnings you get. And that's by trying to get more accurate orbits on your object and on the, the offending object, if you will, the secondary that you might collide with. This, um, this knob, affects a, a change in how many warnings you have to sift through. And it is a squared relationship, which means if you, you know, if you double the number of warnings, uh, a double, double your inaccuracy, that means you have four times the warnings. So it's, it's a really sensitive knob. If we can focus more on getting accurate orbits up front, then we can control how many realistic uh, risks and collision threats we have to sift through. That's, I think, the focus. Yes, there is a, a threshold, if you will, and I would again say it, it goes back to what the operator can sustain, but that in turn should be the driver for one of the other questions in the Q&A uh, chat window, which is um, how, ma you know, how many um, uh, collision risks there are and, and how do we control that? Um, so so the, the point being, if we can, if we can uh, improve our risk, we will dramatically allow ourselves to address those real collision threats and ignore the false ones, if you will. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Mark Dickinson. Yeah, I was just going to follow on from Dan's comment in terms of, I think the answer to that is, the more accurate we have the orbits and the more accurate we know the knowledge of the ephemerides for these objects will allow us to uh, to run more effectively and it does come down so if an, if an object is maneuverable then you have a way of getting out of the way if there's a conjunction the, i think i see the problem coming is when more un, objects which can't be maneuvered we can't mitigate the risk of collision there so it's important that we minimize the number of uh, unmaneuverable objects as they are tidied up. Um, because if we get the, if we have, uh, once we create more debris, then we're gonna have the, 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 uh, the concept of debris on debris. And that's when it starts getting out of control. 
while objects are maneuverable and you have knowledge about them and you have operator information and you have operators that can do something in response to a warning, then that allows things to be managed. Once it gets out of, once you start having objects which are essentially either dead or have no maneuvering, no maneuverable capability, that's when things start getting very difficult to manage. Thank you, Mark. And uh, the other Mark, I okay. believe, wanted to ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just going to raise uh, raise the issue that Mark just raised about um, how how we need to get better in tracking tracking uh, debris on debris and or non-operational satellites. Um, and uh, I think too that uh, uh, the threshold is somewhere um, that uh, that we remember that uh, that risk uh, has two uh, components. Um, it's not only the likelihood, uh, which we in this world measure as probability of a collision, there's also a uh, a consequence that's assigned to a particular risk, and uh, and on most days of the week, um, I think two uh, two U CubeSats colliding, um, although the likelihood goes up because there's going to be so many of them, uh, the consequence isn't nearly as great as two two rocket bodies colliding or an active spacecraft and a rocket body uh, colliding. So I think if we if we calibrate the resources that we have and that we anticipate that that we'll have and uh, start to factor in uh, the consequence uh, component, um, we may be able to do a more efficient job. Victoria, Dan, you want to jump in? Oh, yeah. Uh, Dan, did, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to dovetail on, on something uh, the first Mark was bringing up is that, um, you know, we will have a lot of uh, collisions and, and um, close approaches, in, especially moving forward. I do have some analysis we've done which looks at today uh, the, the collision risk as a function of is it active on active? Is it active on inactive? Or is it debris on debris, which with the, which the first mark mark was bringing up? As we go into this new space era, those statistics are going to dramatically change. Yes, there are debris on debris up there, and they're serious. And you could talk to Darren McKnight, for example, to see some of the very serious risks we face. But as we get all these many more active spacecraft up there. We're going to be driven by active on inactive and active on active, which drives the need for a comprehensive STCM system where data exchange is the fundamental currency. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Um, there's a question specifically for the STC folks we could go into. Um, STC currently fuses data from the own operators, the 18th and Celeste track, but given the growing commercial SSA capabilities, are there any plans to use data from other sources in the future, i.e. commercial catalogs or observations? And if so, what time frame? Any of the SDC folks want to take that one? Yeah, so uh, I, I can, unless Pascal is online and he would like to. Um, so yeah, that's something we have looked at in the past. Um, we've looked at fusing uh, third party catalogs into SDC, which is, technically possible um, we have we've uh, typically hit an issue regarding how we we fund that how we source because uh, uh, most commercial operators obviously their commercial business they want money for their sensor information to be put into the system um, and we have hit we have found problem, we have found being able to get all our members to agree to fund that system um, to bring in that data um, logistically reasonably challenging to do. Um, it's something that we certainly aspire to. Um, we all agree that the fusing of the data and the more uh, the more data the better it, um, is something that would be of benefit. Um, what we do see is we are supporting certainly all the, the government initiatives and the agency initiatives like EU SST uh, and the 18th in terms of providing our data to them and, and, and allowing them to, uh, to fuse their data with it. 
And I think it's important that when, uh, for example, Department of Commerce will make, pick up this uh, activity, that they're able to be able to take uh, sensor data from many different commercial providers and, 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 perform, and perform that fusing activity. Um, and I think that's it's a bit a bit like my um, an analogy back to the maritime world. Um, you have agent, you have government agencies ma maintaining the uh, the maritime spacing, for example, uh, and they use sensor data, whether it's AIS data or other sensor data that they can fuse together to be able to provide that management of traffic lane segregation, for example. So that's how that's way the way we see it going forward. Thank you, Mark. Anyone else, Ms. DC, want to add to that? All right. Looks like we're good. Okay. Another interesting question. We focused a lot on the SSA systems and STM systems that we have currently, looking specifically at Earth orbit. But as brought out, there is a growing interest in cislunar issues. Um, as nations look toward a more uh, permanent, and robust cislunar and lunar presence, how do we build a comprehensive international SSA or STM infrastructure? Features at space missions, and uh, Mark Mahon already popped up his hand. So, Mark. Okay. <laughs> I admit I was looking ahead at the questions earlier. Um, I'll just um, I'll just point out one one aspect that um, that is beginning to happen, and that is an awareness of the uh, the hazards of space weather, especially uh, as you go beyond uh, geostationary orbit. And uh, we've had um, we've had several. Uh, several new companies uh, come to us and uh, talk about that kind of thing. So uh, just, just a couple of examples is that um, the uh, emerging uh, commercial human space flight and space tourism industry really needs to understand and use space weather. Um, you certainly don't, don't want to send up a bunch of space tours right in the middle of a solar flare. Uh, because they won't be in such good shape when they come back. Um, <clears throat> also, um, with uh, the emerging of uh, commercial space stations, uh, perhaps uh, permanent bases on the moon, then you create problems of how do you protect those people. Um, so we've had, um, again, I mentioned uh, companies uh, who want to use space weather data to do things like uh, work with industry that uh, are trying to design new spacesuits and materials for space habitats. If you envision, um, for example, a commercial lunar base uh, with a whole bunch of people out on their lunar buggies, if, if solar flare uh, starts heading towards Earth, you have eight minutes to, to get uh, presumably inside your shelter that uh, protects you. If you're walking around on the moon or in your buggy, uh, you basically have no protection. So there's there's companies that are starting to take a look at that that aspect. Um, so that's that's kind of a emerging uh, emerging business model uh, that's uh, coming out of the uh, desire to go beyond Earth orbit and to uh, to do that successfully and uh, and safely. You really need to to design better materials that protect your people. Thank you, Mark. Any other thoughts from the panelists? Um, well, there's one other question I thought was pretty interesting. Um, when we talk about SSA considerations um, and issues, I think we tend naturally to focus on the technical and engineering aspects. But of course, information is only as good as what we do with it. And this question gets to the heart of that. Um, one other issue that doesn't get discussed is what happens when new sensors come online, more objects will be tracked, driving more conjunction warnings. How do operators react to more warnings? The objects were already there, they just didn't know about them. The risk has not changed necessarily, but still the awareness of that risk. Uh, Dan. Yeah, and, and so I, I tried to lay the groundwork on an earlier response. I don't know if I did it well, but the point is that I think operators are especially in certain orbit regimes are already swimming in alerts. Um, and, and so now if you on top of that add maybe 10 times the number of active spacecraft and then improve the knowledge of things that are already up there by perhaps a factor of 10, you're looking at in certain orbits a hundredfold increase 
in conjunction risk and therefore conjunction notifications and things people have to sift through. So again, it's kind of the same answer I brought up before is that um, we need to have more accurate data like dramatically improved data quality and better metrics and algorithms to assess that not only the, the collision uh, probability, but also as, as Mark Mulholland pointed out, the consequence of that and factor that into the equations to get something that's I think sustainable and something we, we can operate um, for, for spacecraft operators. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Uh, both Marks want to add something here. Let's go with Mark Dickinson and then Mark Mulholland. I was going to form yeah, a, a point that Dan was making there. I, in more sensor information should allow you to have more accurate orbit knowledge. And what more accurate orbit knowledge should allow you to do is essentially have less warnings because you're, then you can make your uh, conjunction um, uncertainty smaller. So by adding, uh, to, to Dan, Dan's point, correct, more objects that is going to, you can see a cascade effect there, but the fact of adding more sensor data shouldn't, uh, more sensors shouldn't be seen as a, as a negative. It will be positive in the sense that it will hopefully allow cross calibration of other sensors uh, and, and lower uncertainties regarding orbit knowledge. And from that will allow you to make more, uh, to react to the really meaningful conjunction events rather than ones which may be uh, the missed distance is actually far bigger than uh, what you would normally uh, perform a, a, an avoidance maneuver for. Thank you. Uh, Other Mark. Okay. I was just going to add that uh, this uh, emerging uh, capability uh, also plays right into the, uh, the academic and science work done in debris characterization. And again, that, that gets into the, uh, the overall risk management realm. Uh, so just to come up with a short example, if I'm driving down the road and I see an object a half a mile in front of me, I'd really like to know whether it's a plastic grocery bag or a leaf spring off a tractor trailer because uh, in each case, knowing what the debris is, I'll take a different action. So I think uh, concurrent with uh, bringing these new sensors and this new observational capability online, there also has to be some, a lot of work done in debris characterization uh, because people will be making uh, different operational decisions uh, based on the, uh, the debris object. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Regina. Hi, thanks. Yeah, since uh, Mark, you just mentioned characterization, I think that's, that's a crucial aspect if we have more accurate um, ways to begin to understand, to characterize events and not even just attribute, but to characterize and describe them. And I think we, uh, we will avoid something that Maria Nalini um, highlighted earlier when, when she spoke um, about mis misperceptions and mishaps. Because uh, we, we do, since, since Mark, I don't know if it's Mark, uh, well, it was Mark Dickinson, I don't know if it's one or two anymore, but um, you mentioned um, these so-called normal accidents, you know, inevitable accidents in, in complex domains. And some of these were, um, caused by mishaps and uh, misperception. And uh, we know this from other domains. So it's, uh, yeah, just wanted to highlight this and bring these points together. Thank you. Um, Runalini, you want to uh, jump in here? Yeah. yeah, I wanted to ask, uh, uh, so this, this might be a bit of a digression, but uh, uh, given the expertise of the rest of the panelists, I wanted to ask, uh, a question related to uh, government regulations for private uh, uh, industry, promotion of uh, encouragement of private industry. So we now, all of us agree that government regulations should not be stifling. So given this background, how, how does one nation ensure promotion of private business while simultaneously abiding by global sustainability standards in space? I'm, any of the panelists can, can take on. Okay, guys, you have one minute. Who wants to take that one? Uh, let's see. Um, Regina, did you have your hand raised? 
Actually, no, uh, I, I think it was still okay. on. I'm super sorry. It's the last one. Uh, Dan or Mark? Yeah, Mahon. Just, just to say this, this again goes back to the Space Safety Coalition and the commercial industry taking their own initiatives to promote long-term sustainability. That's what we call a bottoms up approach. There's also the top down approach that the government comes up with, with, with which is laws and, and so forth. These things uh, both contribute to long-term sustainability. I, I wanna point out again, back to Mark Mulholland's comment, the, the risk times consequence thing. If you look at long-term sustainability, the metrics you might use to quantify risk and, and consequence can be different than those that an operator uses to assure their mission. So there needs to be some sort of handshake there. And I'll, I'll cede the rest of my time. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. And while Mark Maholan gives his final remarks, I'm going to share my screen one last time. Okay. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, um, certainly there's um, external influences from, um, for example, the insurance industry uh, and, uh, and the investment industry that can, along with industry, uh, help to dictate uh, proper norms of, of behavior. And again, uh, just to piggyback on what, what Dan said, uh, the best improvements in the history of the space program have almost always happened from the bottom up. Thank you, Mark. Um, well, we've gone a little over our time, but I just wanted to thank our panel of experts for giving us such a thoughtful discussion of the issues surrounding the, sa the safety of spaceflight. Um, I'm sorry we weren't able to get to everyone's questions, but I think the fact that there was such a volume of interest shows that we have not thoroughly finished this conversation. And with that, I'd like to point out that Secure World Foundation is hosting the second summit for space sustainability. We'll be going into some of these issues that are raised today and a bunch more related to the future sustainable use of outer space. Um, is, you can find out more information at our website, swfsummit.org. It will be virtual September 9th through 11th, so just a little over a month away. And with that, I thank you all for joining and I wish everyone a very good day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody.